Hello everybody, uh, Dr. Rick here dropping in on you. Uh, hope everybody is having a great day. It's been kind of a, a wild week for me, uh, but uh, it is what it is. Look, I'm not going to take too much of your time, but I am going to ask permission to invade your space once again today. First and foremost, we are still in the midst of a fundraiser for the Black Men Lead Rite of Passage Initiative. And maybe after we finish talking about what we're gonna talk about today, you understand why it's so important to support programs like Black Men Lead. Uh, but nevertheless, the link to support uh, the Black Men Lead Rite of Passage Initiative uh, is in the description box or the post box or wherever you're, you're, you're watching this video at. Okay, that's uh, out of the way. Or you can also give through our Cash App account, which is also listed in the description box. Yesterday I posted a brief video uh, concerning the fact that Lakeith Stanfield, which is an up and coming actor, which I think has a lot of talent, um, uh, to me had a unique swag about him. I don't know if swag is a term or he's on purpose to change stuff so much, but he had a unique uh, expression of confidence that, that you know I admired as far as seeing the presentation of manhood and representing what I consider to be uh, a positive image. And then uh, there came the photo floating around the internet of him in a dress with lace, knee-high stockings on and uh, patent leather shoes or some type of shoes uh, with a headscarf on. Um, and so I posted yesterday about the agenda to feminize the black male image. And, you know, a lot of people have followed me a long time and they understand the depths of the research that I've done on this particular topic and understanding the psychology behind it, understanding uh, the media implementation and the use of propaganda and how it works on the psyche and the mind and how powerful it is at controlling human behavior. Those of you who have followed me for years know that because you've read it in The Miseducation of Black Youth, you've read it in Renewing Your Mind, you've read it in Born in Captivity, Psychopathology is a Legacy of Slavery, you've read it in uh, the Undoing of the African Mind, African American Mind, and uh, a number of other books that I've written because it's always been a focus of how propaganda is used, not only against men and the feminization of the black male image, but in the presentation of the black identity, period. It is how they have perpetuated the idea of inferiority uh, amongst blacks and the idea of superiority amongst whites is through uh, the use of. Uh, uh, different forms of media. Before there was social media, that was traditional mass media. Then there's, before there was uh, TV and radio, there was still publications. And it's always been done. Uh, propaganda is the way that Hitler softened up Germany for the extermination of Jews, European Jews. And so, and he literally borrowed uh, the propaganda methodology uh, from people in the U.S. Uh, if you haven't under, if you don't understand propaganda, one of the books that I suggest you read is one of the oldest books on the topic, but still one of the best. Uh, and it's by one of the best ever propagandists, and Edward Bernays. I think it was published like around 1933. Uh, but it was e Edward Bernays' practices uh, that Hitler studied. And so if you can convince an entire people that a race of people are meant meaning them harm and they need to be exterminated to the point that no one I mean not enough people within your own country think there's something wrong with exterminating millions of people uh, that shows you how powerful it is and how quickly he ascended from not even being a German citizen he's from Austria but being able to assume power amongst the ranks and literally overthrow the initial power force within it using it but nevertheless, let, I digress. Let's move back to why I'm here. Most of you who know me know when I talk about it, I'm talking about it in lay terms and I'm talking about it on a very superficial level because that's what people want to talk. 
Nobody wants to talk about the science of it. Nobody wants to talk about all the data out there. Nobody wants to talk about Tom Burrell's book, Brainwash. Nobody wants to go into the depths of how things are used to create certain uh, behaviors, certain in, uh, images, uh, and, and, and a bunch of other things, and how it works with you or for you or against you uh, in depth. I know a lot of you guys do, but I'm talking about in general. People just want to hear, you know, that happened, what, and what, what what's the reason behind it? And so I, I told you what happened. I told you why they're doing it. Uh, but let me let me go a little bit more in depth here because a couple of people came along and said, you know, why, you know, I think one person said, on one end, I can kind of see what you're saying, but I don't understand how clothes uh, identify or make a person. Well, the, the very idea that clothes doesn't make a per person is actually the idea created by uh, propaganda. That was a propaganda message that clothes don't make a man, the man makes clothes, and so so forth. Uh, that, that was actually a media campaign, and it became so ingrained that people talk about it and still use it, but it wasn't a, it's not a unique idea. It's something that someone decided they wanted to put out there for whatever reason. Uh, and there's the counter to it, you know, that you can take uh, almost anybody and dress them up nice and make them attractive. Um, and, you know, so here, here, here's the thing, you know, uh, first and foremost, no matter how liberal or liberated uh, the fat fashion industry becomes, there's still going to be natural mental associations. So let me explain what I mean by that. In other words, your brain is the most powerful supercomputer in the world. Here's the issue. If it was just the most powerful supercomputer computer in the world and it was functioning on artificial intelligence, it can maintain and sustain a certain level of autonomy on whatever's going on to it. But the brain is like any other computer. It operates on the systems and the softwares and the um, programs that you upload onto it. Well, how do you upload things into the brains? Through the primary gates, which are the eyes and the ears. Now, you can also have sensory perceptions in the nose, the, in taste and touch, but the primary gates that control and have the greatest impact on your neurological system and your brain and how your brain impacted and your mind, which is the processes of, you know, understanding and in recognizing that you even exist. It's through the mind, which is immaterial. The brain is material. Okay, so on a neurological level, the brain can process uh, roughly around four, 4 billion to 400 billion bits of information per second. It's way more powerful than we imagined. We drastically underuse it because we've been trained to underuse it. We've been trained and given limitations by our experiences, by what other people tell us, by so many other things. Everything that you see exists now uh, that is considered advancement in technology was because somebody didn't believe what they were told. Literally, somebody didn't be believe when uh, Arvel and Wilbur Wright didn't believe when people told them there's no way you're ever going to fly any kind of machine. Only birds can fly. Uh, they didn't believe it. Uh, Roger Bannister didn't believe when he was told that nobody would ever run the mile in under four minutes. The crazy thing is, I'll show you how powerful uh, these type of messages is. Over time, that message just got out to everybody. Everybody that was in uh, track and field that understood uh, times and distances knew that one of the unbreakable barriers was the four minute mile. You're never gonna break the four minute mile until 1954 when Roger Bannister decided not to listen to it and decided that he was gonna do it. Now here's the crazy thing. People ask Roger Bannister, how did he train for it? How did he train in order to break the mile? This was his response. I simply did it 1,000 times in my head. That's the power of the mind. That's the power of the brain. He literally overrode the lie by repeating a different truth more times than he had ever heard the lie. That counted it. Now, here's the here's the second truth about that very same belief. Two, within two years after him breaking it, another 2,000 people did it. So what did that tell you? It was totally the mind that was stopping him. Not the physical body, but the mind. It's amazing what the mind can call, allow the physical body to do. The mind is normally what shuts down before the physical body actually gives out. You have to understand that. You quit long before your body uh, has actually gone to its full uh, capacity. Uh, now, 
back in alignment with what we're talking about. So what happens is this brain processes, but it processes on what's uploaded. So there are certain things that the brain already has ingrained in it. One is that the dress is feminine. And at one point in time, women wore dresses. Men didn't. And so there is this ingrained thing. And so even though fashion pushes the limits and says, okay, a man can wear a dress. And you, you see people that you look at and, and they're wearing them and you go, okay, it's okay. But there's still something in the mind that associates the dress with being feminine. So the moment that a masculine man puts a dress on, it immediately reduces his masculinity. It simply does. It's a psychological reality. You can argue with it. You can say it's not really happening, but it is happening. I can guarantee you one of the, uh, one of the uh, examples or analogies that I use uh, in, in responding to a person's comment was, okay, you're in a situation where you see some things about to pop off. You have your mom with you, your sister with you, your daughter with you, uh, and your wife with you. And you've got to go do something. And the only dude that's standing there that you can ask to watch your family is a dude in a dress. How confident are you going to be that that dude can get out to the point of defending your family to the death? How, how confident are you? I mean, now, for the sake of imagery, take one of the most masculine black men that you can think about out there now and put him in a dress. You can't tell me that it doesn't immediately shift how you view it. Look at Wesley Snipes. He's been in a dress. Look at The Rock. He's been in a dress. Um, one that I haven't seen, I know Dave Chappelle literally had to uh, retreat from his career because he refused uh, at, at a point in time, they were trying to put him in a dress. Uh, but I know, uh, I've never seen Denzel in a dress. Uh, but most everybody else I've seen put in those compromising positions. Martin Lawrence uh, has done it. Eddie Murphy has done it. Uh, on the down line, Tay Diggs has done it. Tay Diggs has gone way up on the other side. Uh, I've never seen Morris Chestnut do it. I'm just kind of thinking some of the people out there. But but uh, but look at some of these guys and then go back and look at the characters once you saw them in a dress and tell me that it wasn't a different perspective, that you didn't look at it. And it's not whether you liked it or whether you said it was horrible or whether you said that's ridiculous. It's simply a subtle but powerful way of demasculating a man. It is, and in many ways, emasculating him because there are certain things that a man will not be able to do once he is perceived to be feminine. Women will hang out with feminine guys, whether they're gay or straight. They'll hang out with metrosexual uh, guys that teeter towards the middle. But when it when something pops off and they look, they they look. That's a there's a reason why, uh, as as the saying goes, good girls tend to look for black because there's something about a roughneck that says if he's down for me ain't nobody touching me because why first and foremost it's not just that the chances are he's been in a few scuffles and so he knows how to throw those hands the the the, the actual thought is most people are going to look at him and not want to smoke most people are going to look at a dude with a wife beat on and a bandana or a baseball cat and a hoodie, especially a black dude, and automatically assume he's a problem. But guess what happens? If they think he's a problem, guess what they're not doing? They're not causing problems. Same thing. Put the same dude in a dress and he is no longer a threat. Now, he may very well be... I know gay dudes that wear dresses and a bunch of other stuff that you don't want to get in the ring with. They finna bring the smoke and they finna throw hands, but nobody's gonna assume that. Nobody's gonna give them a right of passage or a right of space based off of the fact they're looking at them. 
they would actually have to put them hands on them. Whereas, and there are many spaces that I've been in just looking at a person a certain way. They're already thinking, oh, hell, this dude finna go off. And I was. But what am I getting at? What I'm getting at is you have a, a, a part of your brain that automatically categorizes things within a split second. I mean, within a split second of seeing things, that's why you can see something and immediately your hair stand up on your head or you start to sweat. I mean, immediately before you can even process what you're looking at, your body's already responded to because your brain's already processed it. Your conscious, your subconscious brain has already processed it. Your conscious brain hasn't caught up yet. Why? Because your subconscious can, well, your subconscious mind and your uh, conscious mind, your subconscious mind can process four billion bits of information per second, so can the brain. The problem is the, subcon the conscious mind can only process 2,000 bits per second. You can only focus on so much stuff and on a conscious level, and then you throw yourself out of whack. That's why uh, the brain is trained through the, uh, uh, filtering process, um, uh, what's important to you it's a prioritized thing so in essence um that's that there's a, a a set of neural uh neural connectors uh at the base of the brain called the reticular activating system and it's a filter what it does is it looks for things that you consider important and the way that it does that most important is how much time you spend thinking about it or talking about it and you 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 elevate it another thing is something you put a great deal of emphasis in it becomes important have you ever have you ever had this uh phenomenon a sensation happen where you go out and you buy a shirt or you go out and you buy a car and before you bought the shirt in the car you, you you didn't see that many of them or you really didn't pay that attention and all of a sudden every time you look up there goes your car or that goes your shirt uh, it isn't that everybody went out and bought the car after you bought it. It was that until you bought it, it wasn't that high on your priority list. So your brain didn't isolate it and find it. Once it became a priority, your brain is constantly going, there go your car, there go your car, there go your car. Because it knows you like that car. You like the car so much, you've spent thousands of dollars on it. Okay, the same thing with anything else. What you focus on, you feel. That's why you have to be careful of what you give attention to. But when you're sitting there and you you see something like a guy in a dress before you can even process it your brain had already said look at this photo your, your brain has already said uh feminine emasculated man it doesn't ask why he's in the dress it doesn't care why he's in the dress your brain is simply saying men don't wear dresses and no matter how much uh you become fluidly fashionable the brain is always going to process that because it's never going to get to the point where enough men are wearing dresses to where dresses become neutral. It's what women wear. And it's what questionable men wear. It is. People can get upset. People say, but, but my whole thing is when I and when I speak of men. I am speaking of men who can step into the role of manhood. I'm not speaking of males. Anybody with something swinging is a male. A man is a person who is a male who carries out specific role responsibilities that puts his house, his community, and his race in the right place to win. He carries out these responsibilities at a level that puts himself in second place. In other words, that means he will go to the ends of the earth and to the point of death to carry out those responsibilities. That is a man. And I'm, I'm doing a series, and, and I want to get back to it tomorrow. I'm doing a series on the measure of a man now, on the principles of manhood and what it requires to be classified and categorized as a man versus a male. Okay, so when I say man, I'm not talking about everybody with a swinging pecker. I'm talking about people who literally can be looked at and viewed from the community as a source of power. The key word is source. He's the source of power. He's the source of protection. He's the source of advice. He's the source of leadership. He's the covering. He is literally Abba, the father. And so what happens is when you have a man in a dress, it's just certain things everybody who sees him can't see many of the things and the roles that he's supposed to carry out. So 
it not only feminizes him, it emasculates him. And so when I talk about that, that is what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the clear cut agenda in media to where it is literally pushed on men, especially black men. Now there are some white men, do, but you gotta understand also, the, the greatest uh, asset of a white man isn't his masculinity. It's never been that. It's never been, he has never been able to measure the black man in expressive and overt masculinity. The measure of the, the white man has always been his wealth and his power. So he can afford to be, see others like him in dresses and still not be that uh, much overtaken because very rarely, now there's some white guys out there that can throw throw hands. There's some white guys out there with one hit of quitters. There's some white guys out there you don't want to be in the ring with. That's what they do for a living is they find ways to kick people's ass. That's not every white man. That's not the majority of white men, but you definitely don't just walk up now and think that you could just go throw hands with white men and you're gonna automatically win because you're black. But there is that perception. Among white people, that's the perception. That dude is probably gonna hurt me because that's the perception. But here's the thing. The white man doesn't have to do that. Why? Because the white man has always had power and numbers. He's always had power and numbers. He's always had the ability to deal with things. So what happens when you have power and numbers? You do stuff like, hey, this Negro did this and that's not the word they use. So here comes 100 men to get one, one black man, lynch him, set him on fire, and castrate him. Why do you think they castrated him? Again, that idea of the potency of the black man and what his loins represent is the future of the black race. And even in death, they can't stand the idea of that. And uh, we can go on and on and on about this, but what I wanted to get to is the key element of this is what visits your mind consistently. And then sometimes it doesn't have to be that something is being played over and over in your mind. It has to be something that's so off of what is norm that it has an instant impact and it has an imprintation. An imprintation is, I don't have to see it that many times, but it's so, it's like seeing a dead body, somebody that's got shot. The average person is gonna be traumatized by it unless you grew up in the community like I did where you saw a lot of it and you become a little desensitized to it. But for the average person seeing something that drastic, they never get that image out of their head. So now it's there. And the same thing with seeing a man in a dress, especially a man that up until that point probably had been viewed in the sense of, you know, he's played some roles with Issa Rae and uh, I think the photograph, where I mean, he's really presenting himself as, hey man, this might be the next dude. You know, he's got the charisma, you know, he, he the way he talks is smooth. I mean, the way he pronounces his words. There are those distinctive things. People come along like, you know, a, a couple of them in a generation. Uh, Sidney Portier had a certain way of enunciating. Denzel definitely has a way of enunciating. I'm thinking about guys. And, you know, there, and there are women too. Uh, you know, that when you watch them enunciate, they were there. Uh, Lena Horne. Uh, you know, in the way she not said Halle Berry. Uh, and, you know, and this is probably the psychology of me just over-examining and over-analyzing people, but it's different in there. This guy had, uh, and, and that, there's always something in the power of linguistics, too. So you got to be real careful about what you watch, who you watch, who you listen to, because those linguistical keys and cues have a massive impact on it. We understand, and, 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 and one, of, one, of, one of the things that I mastered is neuro-linguistic programming, and the power of linguistics to control movement and operation is unbelievable. And so you've got to be aware of all of these things and all of the different mechanisms and things that they use to uh, manipulate and control the masses. Um, and so that is what I want to drop on you. Look, I'm gonna go ahead and jump off, but I had to leave that on you, I had to drop that on you. Look, uh, before I can uh, uh, get off of here, I need to tell you, we really do need your support in supporting 
the Black Men Lead Rite of Passage Initiative just for things like this, where we spend a great deal of time properly socializing young black males into black manhood, teaching young black males what is expected of black men. Not black males, black men. So how do you develop into black men? You teach them how to be providers. You teach them how to be protectors. You teach them how to be promoters of those they are covering. You teach them how to be priests in their home. You teach them how to be able to speak life into their family um, and so much more. And we're going to continue to talk about the measure of a man starting tomorrow, but I had to uh, drop in and touch on that. So go to the description box and click that link and uh, support the work we're doing because we need to take this national and we need to connect cities through network so that we're one functioning body of empowering young black males. Click that link. On that note, I'm out of here.